Sagar Shah and I am from India. My rating is 2359 and I have two IM norms. In order to achieve my third norm and international master title, I went to Bulgaria this June of 2013. I played in three tournaments and played 27 games. I had many exciting games with a number of Grand Masters and International Masters. But today I want to show you a game which I played against a player called Sofrano Velizar who is rated 2154. Now the reason why I chose this game is because there are a lot of instructive points in this game which I hope I can be able to convey to you by showing you this game. I hope that you will learn a lot from this game and also enjoy this video. Let's go over to the game. So let us begin with the game c4, knight f6, knight f3, g6, g3, bg7, bg2, castles, castles, d6 d4. By a transposition of moves, we have entered the main variation of Fianchetto King's Indian. My opponent continued with knight bd7, knight c3, e5. And here I played e4. The main thing in the Fianchetto variation is that when you develop the bishop on g2, it gives added protection to the e4 pawn which is the reason why white can maintain the flexibility in the center and he does not have to push with d5 once this flexibility is maintained in the center black can no longer launch his typical kingside attack with moves like knight h5 and f5 because the center is still very fluid it will allow white to open up the center. Hence, in the Fianchetto variation, black attacks are not very frequent. However, what black does aim is to attack white's center. We will see how black achieves that in the game. My opponent played rook e8. In a way, he is now aiming against the e4 pawn. I now played h3. My idea is that I will put my bishop to e3 so that he cannot disturb me with ng4. He took on d4, knight takes d4 and knight c5. You can see how three of black pieces are attacking the e4 pawn. Now it's my question to you, how will you defend the e4 pawn? Yes, over here, I think the only good way to defend the e4 pawn is rook e1. Of course, you can defend it with moves like f3, but of course, that's not a good move. On the other hand, the very desirable queen c2 fails to, yes, knight takes e4, knight takes e4, and the d4 knight is loose, which can be picked up. Hence, I played rook e1. He continued with c6. And over here, I quickly played queen c2. <coughs> of course, to make this move, you need to know the opening theory. And I was well versed with it. The main point is that now I defend the e4 pawn, and my next move is bishop e3, bringing the other rook to d1. The question which I want to ask you now is that, is this move queen c2 a mistake? Does it hang the e4 pawn? And so, have a think and tell me what would you play if your opponent took this pawn? Yes, taking this pawn is a big mistake from black side. Because, I will just take knight takes e4 and you definitely cannot play knight e4 because after rook into e4 I'm just a piece up. I defend my d4 knight. So you will have to play over here bishop into d4 when white has a very strong move 
bishop g5 connecting his rooks and threatening knight f6 so if the queen goes to c7 or b6 or a5 I have this very strong move knight f6 check winning the rook on e8 on the other hand a move like f6 will lose to the strong move bishop into f6 and after bishop takes f6 which is the only move knight f6 queen f6 rook e8 and I am an exchange up hence the only move for black here would be queen d7 when after knight f6 check bishop into f6 bishop into f6 you can see that this strong bishop will lead to a mate pretty soon as maybe white queen will just come this side and black is very close to winning this a uh, white is very close to winning this position okay so the e4 pawn cannot be taken my opponent was not well versed with theory so he had a long think over here but I think he understood that taking the e4 pawn is dangerous and so he continued with the normal move a5 now this move is starting plan for black of queenside play black would like to put his pawn on a4 put the queen to a5 knight maybe goes from d7 to b6 and then he starts creating dangerous counterplay with his knight on c5 queen on a5 the strong bishop on g7 okay but white on the other hand will try to play on the king side so I continued my development normally with bishop e3 and black played a4 I brought in my rook to d1 of course I have a small tactical threat now and that is if it were my move now I would take on c6 b takes c6 and bishop into c5 when this pin will prove decisive okay so my opponent removed his queen from the d8 square and played queen a5 okay so clear battle lines have been drawn now I am playing on the king side he is playing on the queen side I have not started my king side play and with my next move I did that with f4 okay now over here my opponent made a move h5 what do you think about this move if you ask me personally I was extremely happy to see this move now why would that be there is a general saying in chess that never move the pawns on the side of the board where you are weak in this position you can see black is clearly weaker on the king side hence every pawn move that he makes on the king side will help white to create targets now this move h5 does stop g4 for the time being but makes the g6 pawn pretty weak so later on if I can go f5 it might create a lot of problems for black so always remember don't if it is possible don't move the pawns on the side of the board where you are weaker <clears throat> okay so to h5 I played bishop f2 now this move can be explained as I want to defend the e pawn and I want to move my knight to f3 because I have new squares available on g5 or maybe h4 because the g6 pawn is weak so before that I need to defend the e4 pawn because when the knight goes to f3 the g2 bishop will no longer defend the e4 pawn so I just moved my bishop back Okay. over here he continued knight d7 now my question is I played should I play over here knight f3 and what is the problem with that move yes the problem with knight f3 is that black would play 
a3 an excellent move because after a3 I cannot take this pawn because of the combined effect of the queen and bishop on the c3 knight and my queen side is in total ruins black will be better over here hence over here I made the move a3 I can see people asking me just a move ago you said don't make pawn moves on the side of the board where you are weak how can you move make a move like a3 you are absolutely right in asking me this question but there are always exceptions to the rule over here the move a3 is not made so that I can play on the queen side but I want to attack on the queen's king side and black's counterplay is really quick on the queen side so I make the move a3 to stop his counterplay yes of course chess is not so simple that you can form it form some rules but it's always good to know them okay my opponent now made a very bad move he played bishop h6 his idea is to play h4 and undermine the f4 pawn as I said he should not be playing on the king side he should rather look for counterplay on the queen side the right move would have been knight b6 when I would have to defend the c4 pawn with maybe bishop f1 okay as things stood he played bishop h6 and I was able to play knight f3 stopping h4 and also starting to put pressure on the d6 pawn he had no other option but to defend his weakness with bishop f8 now over here I would like to tell you something in chess there is something known as a critical moment now what is this critical moment a critical moment is often a point in the game where you will have to have a good think and when you have a good think and play a certain move it will often decide the outcome of the game now learning which position is a critical moment is a huge art in itself dynamic players like Kasparov Anand very easily knew that this position was the critical moment of the game and they would put in a lot of time and effort during that position now for us to know the critical position is not such an easy thing but I would like to give you a small advice always try to look at the activity of your pieces in this position if you see all my pieces are perfectly placed they are tremendously active on the other hand you can see black has for the time being a certain problem in communication or coordination between his pieces the bishop on c8 is blocked because of the knight on d7 on the next move black will play knight b6 and he will get rid of that problem so if you see this position exactly the one over here is the critical moment of the game and that's the reason why I would ask you to have a good think over here and once you have that try to find the best move for white okay I think you must have had a good think over this position so what did you come up with the move that I came in the came up with in the game didn't come to me easily the most obvious move which I thought during the game was f5 the problem which I found with this move was that it weakened the e5 square black would immediately jump knight e5 let's say I took on e5 rook e5 and I played bishop d4 if the rook moved back let's say to e8 I would take on g6 take on g6 and play e5 when my queen would really enter the game and it might be really dangerous okay it's a possibility but 
what I was afraid of really at this point was bishop g7 sacrificing an exchange after bishop e5 bishop e5 I'm an exchange up true but black has an excellent bishop on e5 now the main point which I want to make by this variation is that if I played f5 over here I was losing the control over the very important e5 square now when I made this analysis at first I came to the conclusion that I must not give up the e5 square and hence I came to this idea of sacrificing a pawn with e5 which is a very strong move and after d into e5 not to take back the pawn which would also have been a good move but to play f5 now the point is no longer the e5 square is weak the knight can no longer come over here and my queen has now opened up really dangerously towards the black king my opponent now could see actually no real way to play in this position than to defend the g6 pawn and he defended it with king g7 now the first part of the problem is done now I ask you the next question how would you continue the attack would you now play f into g6 or would you play maybe knight h4 during the game I had a big choice to make if I took f into g6 he would take back and if I played knight h4 attacking the g6 pawn he got the e6 square for his rook to defend the g6 pawn this position is still pleasant for white he has good attacking chances but I think it's not so clear during the game I decided to deprive him of the e6 square and played knight h4 now the g6 pawn is attacked he has no way to defend it the only move that he can make is to play g5 of course I had considered this move and over here I had a surprise another surprise waiting for him of course it doesn't matter if you have given up a pawn or two pawns in an attack the main thing is that your pieces must get into the critical zone the critical zone I think is this place if your pieces can enter that that zone you will be bet you will get a successful attack and hence I played f6 clearing the way for my knight I think the only move now is to take this pawn with knight into f6 and I jumped in with knight f5 the point being that he cannot take this knight because I take back with the queen and all these pawns are really weak if you see and I will be able to checkmate him not very not with much effort so he had to go back he played king g8 and now I think is the main point of my play I played now knight d6 the main point that I am trying to make here is that black has two good bishops in his position one bishop is controlling all the light squares the other bishop is controlling all the dark squares with this move knight d6 I ask him do you want to take on d6 and weaken your dark squares because once the rook enters on d6 I think his king is really exposed my queen will go to d2 start putting pressure on g5 and he will have a very hard time on the other hand if he does not take on d6 I will take on c8 because his rook is attacked so if suppose he moves his rook let's say to d8 over here I might take on c8 rook c8 and get in queen f5 when he will be terribly weak on the light squares in the position so though I'm a two pawns down 
I have this great compensation of weak square complexes you can see weak color complexes in the position my opponent was pretty smart he said I'm not going to give you any weak colors in my position I and he instead played bishop d7 giving up an exchange in order to secure his light and dark squares okay I said at least let's take the exchange I took on e8 rook takes e8 and after this I am now materially pretty fine I need to find the next move and over here black would be really fine if his two pawns were back on g7 and h7 but they are on g5 and h5 and hence his king is pretty weak so I played this next move queen d2 trying to attack the g5 pawn he has no real good way of defending that pawn he could play knight h7 when I would go knight e4 attacking the queen and also knight c5 and after queen d2 rook d2 knight into e4 I would take the bishop on d7 with a clear advantage because my pieces are really active in the game he played a bad move he didn't defend with an h7 and he played knight e6 it's your move now I'm sure that each one of you will find this move for white I made this move and it immediately made him to resign the game so what move is it yes I'm sure each one of you found this move and that was knight e4 it is kind of a discovered attack I attack his queen and let's say he takes on d2 then I go knight f6 check an intermediate move king g7 another intermediate move take with check bishop e8 rook d2 and I am I think a rook and an exchange up so in this position of course he could have defended better he made a bad move knight e6 and after knight e4 he had to resign the game If I were to ask you what was the best move in the game that you saw right now, it was without doubt the idea of playing e5, d into e5, followed by f5. Now, the question that you would ask me is, is it possible to find such ideas over the board? And my answer to that was, would be, it's extremely difficult. But, I would like to tell you a small secret. The idea which I used in this game was seen by me when I was 16 years old, that is 7 years ago, when I was reading a book called Can You Be a Positional Chess Genius by Angus Dunnington, a book which I would highly recommend. In that book, I saw a position of Botwinnik and in that game, Botwinnik used exactly the same idea. Let's have a look at that position and try to see how the con contours of both the position match each other. The following is a snippet out of the game Botwinnik versus Pomar from 1962 Olympiad. Uh, in this position, it is white to play and uh, I would like you to think for two minutes and try to think of what white played over here in this game Botwinnik in this position Botwinnik would like to play f5 now this move is, a, is an attacking move but the point is that it opens up this bishop the bishop on d6 becomes an excellent piece. The knight on c6 gets a wonderful square on e5. My bishop on g2 on the other hand becomes quite a dead piece whereas knight on d2 has no good square. So you see f5 is a positional blunder. Now 
the move that Botwinnik made in the game was e5. With this move, first of all, Botwinnik is sacrificing a pawn, and after Pomar took it f into e5, Botwinnik pushed ahead with f5. Now, Pomar saved his bishop with bishop f7, and Botwinnik jumped in knight e4. Now you can see the benefits of the sacrifice of a pawn. First of all, the pawn has moved to f5, but the dark squared bishop on d6 has become a dead piece. The black knight no longer has a good square on e5, and our bishop on g2 is breathing fire in the position, and the knight on e4 is a really great piece. Thus you can see the idea which I used in my game is pretty similar to the one that Botwinnik used in the game. He wanted to push his pawn to f5, however he didn't want to give e5 square as an outpost and hence he sacrificed a pawn and brought a black pawn on that square. The similarity of the idea between my game against Soprano and Botwinnik's game was quite surprising. Botwinnik had used this idea in 1962, which I read about in 2006 and I used it in 2013. So, what I would like to tell you is that you are also using ideas used by other players. However, mainly we use it in the opening phase of the game. A very important addition that you can make to your arsenal is to recognize the patterns occurring in the middle game and then to make a note of them and use them in, their, in your own games. The right way to do it would be that when you are studying a certain players, a good players game, suppose a world champions game, after seeing the game, Try to note down something new that you have learned from the game, some pattern. As you start doing this, the number of games you start watching, the number of ideas in your arsenal will increase. And someday you would be able to use that idea in your game and you would be able to effectively win the game quite easily. And so I would like to end this topic by saying that Pattern recognition is one of the key features that a chess player must have in order to become a grandmaster. Thank you.